In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about different types of memories and how you shape your worldview. Okay, so, so here's one of Piaget's propositions, and, and it is that because facts flux in some sense across time, you're looking for something that doesn't change across time, to call it a real fact. And so what Piaget is trying to point out in this, let's call it introductory paragraph, is that the one thing that doesn't change is the manner in which people generate facts, rather than the facts themselves. So the ultimate fact is a fact about the way people generate facts. All right, and so Piaget's theory in part is a, is a theory about how knowledge is acquired and transformed. And so it's not, that no, it's not a study of the knowledge itself, it's a study of the process by which the knowledge is generated. And he believed that that process was unchanging, at least with regards to human beings. And so you could think of the Piagetian genetic epistemological mystery as being, how is it that people form and transform representations of the world? And one of his conclusions about that is that there's a standard process. And then the reason that I'm telling you about Piaget right now is because, as far as I can tell, the standard Piagetian description of the manner in which knowledge is acquired and transformed is the same thing that's represented in the mythology of the shamanic transformation, which is that there's a state of being, and then it's disrupt disrupted by something chaotic, and there's a disintegration period, and that's the space between the the stage transitions for, for children, in which time they're often upset because their little theory about the world isn't learning, it, isn't working anymore. And then in that chaotic period, they adjust themselves to new anomalies. And anomalies are what occur when you act in the world and what you want to happen doesn't happen, right? Because that means there's something wrong with your knowledge structure. If you act and then something happens you don't want to happen, something's wrong with the way you're representing the world. Or you could say something's wrong with the world, but good luck with that. Although, you know, people can modify the world as well as modifying their belief structures, and people do that a lot. But so, this, the P Piagetian stage transition, as far as I can tell, is a micro case of the broader idea of the, the existence of an orderly state, its dissolution into a chaotic state because something unexpected has occurred, and then its retransformation into a more integrated state. Now, Piaget would say, well, the initial state and the chaotic state and the final state aren't the ultimate realities. The ultimate reality is the process of moving through those stages. And that's how people acquire knowledge. And that's, you could say, that's the central element of human beings. And I would say that's, a, that's another re-representation of the hero myth. Because the hero is the person who notes anomaly, notes something that's changed, that's outside of explored territory, encounters it, defeats it, let's say, or get something of value from it and then recasts it into the world, shares it with the community, restructures the world. And so that's the central story. It's, it's not the central story of human beings, but it's, it's close enough for, for our purposes at the moment. So, okay, so that's what Piaget is about. How do human beings encounter the world and, and what happens when they do that? Now, the thing about the world for Piaget is it's also a complicated place. It's not exactly the set of it's not the set of all objective facts that remain to be discovered because Piaget is a constructivist and he's more of a pragmatist than he is precisely a, a scientific realist. And so that's a complicated thing, a very, very complicated thing. If all knowledge is always in a state of development and consists in proceeding from one state to a more complete and efficient one, so that, that implies a hierarchy of states, right? That you move from one knowledge structure to the next one, which includes the previous one and is better. And it's better because it covers more territory. That's how you know it's better. It does the same thing the old tool does, plus some additional things. So it's a definition of better. It's a good thing to have a definition of better and worse. If all knowledge is always in a state of development and consists in proceeding from one state to a more complete and efficient one, evidently it is a question of knowing this development and analyzing it with the greatest possible accuracy, which is something I happen to agree with, but that's partly because I read Piaget and, and I think I understand what he meant and he's, he's quite the thinker. And how is Piaget purporting to manage this? Well, one thing he does is he, for Piaget, it's really important that you have a body and that's one of the things that's very cool about his thinking. So you could think about him as an early exponent of embodied cognition. It's like, he's not exactly a Cartesian, a follower of Descartes. He doesn't really believe that you have a spirit or, say, a rational mind that is in some sense separate from your body, which is an implicit presupposition of a lot of, a lot of, uh, of philosophical claims. Piaget really sticks you in your body. And the other thing that Piaget claims is that your abstract knowledge is actually 
determined by the structure of your body and that it unfolds from your body up into abstraction and that's what happens as infants transform into adults. First of all, almost all their knowledge is embodied and what that means is that it's not... Look, there's a couple of different kinds of memory. Like the most, the most fundamental distinction you might think of is between procedural representation, procedural memory and and representational memory. So when you remember your past, that little movie that runs in your head, or maybe the facts that you can recite about your past, that's episodic memory, that's representational. But procedural memory is different. Procedural memory is how you walk. You don't know how you walk. That's how you ride a bike, it's how you play the piano, it's how you type. So it's, it's automatic, right? It's built into your nervous system. It's built into the nerves that innervate your musculature. And they're completely separate memory systems. Now, one can represent the other, which is interesting. The representational system can represent the output of the body, which is basically what, you happen, what happens when someone tells a story, even when you tell a story about your own life. But the contents of procedural memory uh, precede the contents of representational memory, and they're shaped in different ways. So, for example, Part of the wisdom that's encoded in your body is there because of things you've practiced, but it's also there because you've practiced things in a social environment. And so while you practice those things, the effect of the social environment shaped the way you learned it, and that's encoded right in your neurons. It's not representational. It's encoded in the way you do things. It's encoded in the way you smile when you look at someone, or frown, or when you do that. And that's all implicit. It's not under your conscious control. It's not even in that system. And so Piaget figured this out, and so one of the things he said was that you start as an infant by building your procedural memory, not your representational memory. That's partly, perhaps, why you can't remember your infancy. You don't actually don't have that kind of representational memory there. What you do is you act. You learn to act. You build your body so that it can move. And you do that partly by experimenting with your own body, but you also do that by experimenting with your body in a context that's shaped from the beginning by the presence of other people. So, for example, you know, a child learns how to breastfeed, its mouth is pretty wired up right at birth, okay? And, and the rest of its body isn't wired up very much at all, but its mouth is. And you might think, well, that's just a reflex, and that Piaget would agree with that. It's a built-in, it's something built-in that, that a baby can do right at birth. But even in the act of breastfeeding, the baby has to learn how to modify that reflex so that it gets along with its mother. So even at the very beginning with the most, you might think the most primordial acts, there's a sociological influence and there's a mutual dynamic going on that's really, really important. It's really important. And so in some sense for Piaget, the structure of society is implicitly built into the structure of the procedural memory system. And so one of the things you might think about that, and Piaget makes much of this because he looks at the relationship between play and dreams and imitation. So he's kind of a quasi-psychoanalyst. One of the things that means is that coded in your behavior is, is, the, is the social structure in which you emerged. And it's coded in a way that you don't actually understand. You just know how to act. And then you can figure out how you're acting and you can extract out of that some of the social rules, but you don't, you don't, that doesn't mean that you know the rules. It meant that the rules were built into you. Here's a way of thinking about it. Like a wolf pack, a wolf pack knows how to operate together. It knows how to hunt, right? And each wolf knows where every other wolf is in the dominance hierarchy. But they don't know they know that. They don't have rules, right? They don't have a code. They don't have laws. What they have is behavioral regularities, patterned behavioral regularities. And those are like a morality. They're very, very, in fact, that's exactly what they are. A dominance hierarchy of animals that aren't representational, you know, that don't have language. At least they don't have language. The dominance hierarchy is a kind of morality. It's a way of, it's a way of setting up individual behavior within a social context to maximize cooperation and minimize competition. 